Hello everyone and uh, welcome to another webinar run by the Australian National Data Service, ANS. My name is Luis Martinez Uribe. I'm a, I'm a research data analyst at ANS. And uh, today we have James Wilson from the University of Oxford. James uh, took over my position after I left Oxford at the end of 2009. Uh, and since then, he has been involved in a, in a number of uh, research data management infrastructure projects and uh, trying to retroactively fit some strategy around the, these projects. Uh, he has a background in the humanities. Um, he was manager of the Humboldt's, Humboldt Humanities Hub, uh, later called Intuit Arts and Humanities. And today he'll be talking about the approach Oxford is taking to build an RDM infrastructure for the university and attempting to put that into the UK context. So um, he'll be talking for about 20, 30 minutes and then we'll be taking questions at the end of the talk. So you can use the question box that you will find uh, in your GoToWebinar software in the probably your right side of the screen. And you can write your uh, questions and, and comments and we'll deal with them at, at the end of the talk. Without further ado, I'll leave you with James Wilson. All yours, James. Okay, good afternoon everybody. And, uh, Good morning to me. It's a little bit early for me at the moment, so if I say anything nonsensical, then uh, uh, that's my excuse for doing so. Um, so I've been talking for probably about half an hour as Lewis says about the kind of infrastructure work we've been doing here. Um, and I might as well get straight into it and um, just introduce a little bit about the AHA. First typical problem, I can't seem to change my slides. No, nope, here we are, here, here it goes. Okay, so I'll just start off by talking a little bit about the, um, the national context in the UK. Some of you may well um, be familiar with some of this already, but um, this is the kind of context that we're working in. Um, so to start off with, it's worth pointing out that there, are, there have been several well-established subject-specific data repositories in the UK for, for quite a number of years. Um, the UK Data Archive is the example that I've noted down here. They look, look after mostly um, social sciences data with some humanities data, and they've actually been going since 1967. So the concept of of research data management is hardly a new one. Um, however, over the last sort of 10 or 15 years, I think there has been a, a general sort of growing awareness of the importance of research data management and an awareness of the fact that the traditional subject data repositories weren't necessarily being as well used as um, people might have liked. And, um, and whilst they were getting some data, they weren't capturing everything and the reuse wasn't wasn't quite as great as people might expect. Um, and it, I think partly in response to that, a number of the UK research councils have been introducing um, new and more specific requirements regarding data management planning. Um, but it seems anecdotally, from what I've been finding out by talking to people, that the, the actual checking up on people and checking that they've actually followed their data management plans and have actually published data at the end of their research has been rather patchy. Um, in 2004, uh, the JISC, which is the Joint Information Systems Committee, they're basically the funding agency who are responsible for technical innovation in higher education in the UK. Uh, they kind of launched an organization called the Digital Curation Centre, who were launched in particular to kind of try and um, support data curation in the long term, the long term preservation and reuse. It started off as very much uh, a libraries kind of based thing, but uh, over recent years, it's becoming more and more focused on the researchers themselves, and I think that's a that's a trend that we're seeing in the UK. Um, in 2007, a different organisation, UCON, um, wrote a report for the GISC that recommended that each higher education institution should implement an institutional data management, preservation, and sharing policy, uh, which recommends data deposit in the appropriate open access data repository and/or data centre where these exist. So, in some ways, this is beginning to really mark the need for higher education institutions um, to become involved in this rather than simply the, um, the subject specific data repositories and individual researchers funded by the research councils here. Uh, in 2009 they just commenced um, the Managing Research Data Program which was really a, a major effort to coordinate national developments, um, particularly um, institutional developments to serve research data management and that's been responsible for funding a number of the projects that have been undertaken in the UK, including many of our own projects. 
something you may well be aware of in 2009. Um, there's an article in Nature called Data's Chain from Neglect, which is really an appeal to researchers to start managing their data better and arguing that this should be an essential part of every researcher's training to know how to look after their research data. And more recently, in 2011, the Research Council's UK agreed a common set of principles on data, which they expect to be followed. And in particular, the um, EPSERC Research Council, the um, Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, um, created a specific policy of their own, which has really um, reinvigorated attempts, um, sort of re-stimulated attempts to produce better uh, institutional research data management, because what it's done is it's put the emphasis much more on on the institutions to actually support researchers with their research data management rather than putting the responsibility primarily on the researchers themselves, which tended to be the case beforehand. So in 2009, um, when Lewis really just started working on this kind of stuff um, at Oxford, uh, we produced a commitment to RDM. Uh, I'm not going to read through this um, in entirety. You can, you can read it on the screen. But one thing that's worth noting here is that uh, much of the commitment is about it's always the latter stages of the research data management chain. So it's about the appropriate curation and preservation. It's about uh, federated institutional data repositories, um, long-term management. Um, it does indicate some things that have really informed the progress since then, such as the fact that it's needed to also be developed and supported by several departments within the university. It's not purely a libraries thing. Um, but the emphasis at this point is still very much on on the kind of library side developments about the long-term preservation and curation of data. Um, now, it quickly became obvious to us, um, talking to researchers and uh, working with researchers, that in some ways the kind of long-term preservation and curation of the data was, was only a part of what we really needed to do at Oxford. Um, and in some ways it was the part that was already being done by the institutional repositories, um, the subject-specific repositories around the country. Um, and it became apparent to, to us that really what we needed to do was intervene across the sort of entire research data uh, life cycle, um, beginning with actual project planning, which the research councils were covering in some ways by insisting in many cases on some kind of data plan. But then we needed to work and fill in all the kind of the gaps between to make sure that the data and the metadata captured in the plan could then be passed through, um, that as people actually created their data, they created it in such a format um, which would allow it to go into an institutional or subject-specific uh, data repository and then have a suitable rediscovery and retrieval mechanism built on top of that. So this, this diagram is kind of our idealized vision of, of what we're really hoping to create, this kind, of, um, this kind of life cycle approach. And you can see at the end there that the idea is that with the reuse, the re retrieval of other people's data or the research's own data maybe from years, years gone by, can then be reinserted into current research and invigorate and inspire new research, which is why you have this dashed arrow going back to the project planning. And all of this, all of these steps, need to be underpinned really by training and support. So with this kind of with this kind of idea in our in our minds, we kind of launched on a well, I suppose a program. It, it didn't formally begin as a program, but it's it's evolved into a program really as we've as we started to put the pieces into place. So within Oxford, we really began in 2008 um, with an internal scoping study into data management requirements, which looked particularly at the needs of researchers. And this was something that Lewis was involved in. Um, then really, we got started with JISC funding um, with their new program with the IDXA. It's a horrible acronym, but it stands for Embedding Institutional Data Curation Services in Research. Um, and in that project, we were really looking at preservation workflows, um, trying to actually build our commitment into, a, into an actual university policy, um, as had been recommended by UCOLN earlier, and sort of work, out, work on the kind of communications aspects, how to actually communicate the basics of research data management skills and information and sources of further information um, to the researchers within the university. And we actually had a bit of, a bit of a helping hand on the, uh, on the policy and kind of comms front actually from uh, the University of Melbourne. So we were, we were drawing um, from some of the experience um, that the Australian universities had developed before we really knew what we were doing ourselves. So that was quite a good um, way to start off. And that's been followed by a number of other projects, most of which have been just funded as you'll see. 
Sidani stands for supporting data management infrastructure for the humanities. I hope I'm going to get all these acronyms correct. Um, and in that project, we started building a, a database as a service, which I'll come back to a bit later, and a number of training materials for researchers. Um, the Admiral project, which I think was a data management infrastructure for research across the life sciences, was working with people um, in biology and really looking at their kind of research workflows. And they started um, resourcing what's now becoming our kind of institutional data repository, um, which is called Data Bank. And this is, it's not, the work's still unfinished at the moment, but it's, it's gradually taking shape. And this is what we'll actually be using as the sort of counterpart to our, uh, our Oxford Research Archive, which is our existing archive um, for actual research papers and so forth. And Data Bank will be the, the branch of that, if you like, which, uh, which actually holds the research data to accompany it. And now as we've developed it further, we're broadening it out and it will basically hold any kind of data which can't be held in Aura. And again, I'll come back to that in a bit. The VIDAS project, that's virtual infrastructure with databases as a service, um, was a, a fairly heavily funded thing by JISC and uh, the Higher Education Funding Council um, of England. And that was really to develop the databases as a service that we'd started in Sidani into a, a more of a mature tool and to build a cloud infrastructure at Oxford so that we could, we could set the service up as a cloud-hosted um, service. The Dataflow project um, further developed the data stage uh, further developed um, the data bank, um, data repository, and also started work on a tool called Data Stage, which is kind of a counterpart um, to the database as a service, but for unstructured data, which I shall talk about in a minute. Bringing ourselves up to the present day, we're now working on the data management rollout at Oxford, <coughs> which is hopefully um, finalizing data bank, working more on training, reducing policy. Um, building a data finder tool, which will be effectively act as a, as a metadata repository, um, as a catalog of data held not simply in data bank and our own local data stores at Oxford, but data held in all sorts of other places as well. And we're now starting to think about how we're actually going to integrate all the things we've got into, into this kind of this kind of hold to produce natural integrated infrastructure. Um, we're just beginning work on what's called the AUDS Maturity Project. This is basically taking the database as a service to a service launch. AUDS stands for the Online Research Database Service. And we're just hoping, fingers crossed, that we can get a bit more funding from uh, Chisk and Hefty again um, to really commercialize uh, the database as a service. This is something that they've been pushing for from the word go. It's part of the UK's um, kind of shared services agenda. Um, JISC having this kind of coordinating role are quite keen that rather than every university simply creating their own services and investing a lot of money in something that only they're going to use. <coughs> that um, really all these services are actually shared and one of the ways they're looking at doing this is to get um, commercial companies involved or to set up kind of um, national spin-out companies from some of these services so that they can be provided not simply to the universities that, that made them but can really be offered as a service much more broadly and in the longer term there's nothing really to stop these services um, from becoming international services as well. So most of what we're building at the moment is open source software, so people can pick up the software and customize it for their own institutions. But what, what JISC are really driving for in the longer term is that these things are, are served on a larger scale. They're served um, from one place um, to many different institutions as a way of keeping costs down, because that's something that we're having to deal with a lot throughout this, is making sure that we can actually pay for everything, because there isn't much with the economic conditions at the moment, there isn't much fresh money, there isn't much free money available to really do this. We have to kind of pay our own way and be very careful over with the pennies. So I'm now going to take a look at the outputs from ICSA and then rather than going through project by project in great detail, because many of the projects have really been working on the on the same kind of tools, I'll actually look at the individual tools that we're working on. I hope that will uh, add a bit of clarity. <coughs> so the the IPSA project kind of stands alone a little bit because it's the first one we did, because we were working with quite a narrow set of researchers who were looking at uh, 3D heart imaging. And we were really trying to understand their own requirements, but then extrapolate from that the kind of requirements that researchers would have across the university as a whole. So we were in some ways trying to meet the immediate needs of that particular research group, but also thinking about how to apply things more broadly. Um, during the project, we came up with a draft university um, data management policy, research data management policy, 
uh, which we worked on for quite a lot of time, got quite a lot of advice on, as I've mentioned, and which was then, unfortunately, at the end of the project, rejected. Um, so we did all this work, and it didn't it didn't come to nothing, but it was rejected on the basis that we were kind of obliging our researchers to do all these things and putting these obligations on departments to provide training and so forth, and basically saying saying that researchers should use this um, research data management infrastructure but before we actually had the infrastructure in place. So we were basically told to go away and rethink this policy and actually develop the infrastructure first so that when we when we did actually publish the policy to the university as a whole, people were actually in a position where they could they could actually follow the follow the policy and do what they were being expected to do. Um, another part of the project, um, we produced the research data management web portal, a screenshot of which you can see on the right hand side of the uh, of the screen there. This is really intended to act as <coughs> the kind of single single port of entry um, for researchers at Oxford who wanted to find out more about research data management. So the idea is you can see on that wheel that we've taken a kind of a life cycle approach here in terms of breaking up the kind of aspects of research data management they might be interested in at a given point in the kind of research cycle. And each of those links through to a further menu which tells you where to go for advice, gives some hints and tips links to our own kind of training materials that we've developed within the university but also to national resources um, and gives some quite detailed kind of information about how to go about drafting a data management plan and all those kind of things. So the idea is that this is a, a publicly accessible place where our research can go. It is open to the wider public so if you want to take a look at it just follow the, uh, follow the link there. <coughs> So far, we have had quite a lot of people um, visiting and using it. I don't have the stats to hand, but it seems to be pretty popular. Other things we did during Ike's so were we created almost as a kind of a side project, really, the 3D image visualization um, software. Uh, we came up with a kind of a core research data metadata schema, so the kind of things, the kind of fields that we need to capture about basically all research data, not simply the ones that our researchers were working with in that project we're using. A more general thing, and that was then kind of shelved for a little bit. But we're now coming back to that in the Damaro project, which I'll come back to. And we also look to develop a, a kind of a, a metadata edition and archiving client um, for the researchers. So the idea was that basically we were well, we were essentially told at the time to, to use our existing infrastructure in terms of our hierarchical file server um, and to essentially get our researchers to back up and archive things on that, which they have done since time immemorial, um, but then also to add metadata with it. So we came up with a number of kind of ideas and workflows about how this might work in practice with our researchers. Um, but there was a bit of a problem in that the, our, our HFS system was uh, rather antique and didn't actually have any room uh, for metadata. <clears throat> so whenever anyone deposited data there, there was basically, you could add there was, there was there was effectively kind of one field that was free and we could either take the approach of trying to add all the metadata there or link it to metadata held somewhere else. So we took the approach of linking to metadata elsewhere so that we could essentially change and enrich that metadata. But then there were great problems of actually keeping um, the metadata synchronized, the metadata held in one store synchronized with the actual data held in this rather old fashioned um, backup and archiving client. So in the end, we didn't pursue that route further, but that's that's what we investigated in that project. Okay, moving on to the <coughs> the actual tools we worked on. Um, this is one that I've been in charge of so far. This is our database as a service, which will in due course be called the Oxford Research Database Service. Um, so the, the, the database as a service is the title of the software. Uh, the Oxford Research Database Service will be the title of the service. The way this, the way this works is essentially a system for structured data. Or relational databases. We will in future be ex expanding it to deal with XML databases as well, but that's something for the future. <coughs> it begins with a, a researcher with a bright idea for some research. Then the idea is the researcher simply goes to a website that uh, we support within the university where they can register their interest, uh, they can register a project, give a bit of information about what the project's like, and set aside uh, a bit of space for, um, for the database within their project. Then basically what they get, what, the, what we deliver to them is this cloud hosted database. It's centrally hosted, regularly backed up and so forth. Uh, they can import 
or export existing databases. So a number of the researchers we spoke to had old uh, Access, Microsoft Access databases, for instance, which they quite wanted to get online because then they could collaborate on that database uh, with their colleagues. They could allow access um, to it to members of the public, and all those things you can't really do when you've got a database on a floppy disk in a drawer somewhere. So there's quite a few researchers in that kind of position. It allows people to build and structure databases from scratch, or indeed if they've got an old database to, to restructure that to add new tables or relationships, um, add columns and so forth. <coughs> and that's a graphical drag and drop interface. Moving on, there's a basically a generic um, kind of data um, editing interface and searching inter interface. Um, the idea is that the whole piece of software is supposed to be quite easy for people to pick up and uh, quite straightforward and work with any um, relational database, really. Um, but if the, if the generic kind of editing and searching interface isn't appropriate for your project, if you want a, a very smart kind of public-facing front-end, um, then that's possible. So you can use the, you can use the, the database as a, as a service system, really just as a back-end, and then build your own website on top of that. And certainly one of the projects that we were working with here at Oxford, um, uh, the Oxford Roman Economy Project, that was very much what they had in mind, because they wanted a, a flexible underlying database, which then they could um, plot results on maps. So the, the database as a service isn't really intended to be a swanky um, tool for visualizing data, um, but rather one where you can do all the underlying basics. And the other kind of ambition, really, of the, of the database as a service is that it's very easy, once you've got the data and metadata in this centrally stored, um, backed up format, to then simply move it into the longer term archiving. So once people are, once people no longer need the live website up and running, it can simply be packed up, moved into data bank or other tools, and then unpacked again if needed, if other people need to come back to the data and to consult it in the future. Moving on, a data stage is um, a very simple um, tool, or a very simple idea anyway. It kind of complements uh, the database as a service, but it's it's one that works for researchers who are really using unstructured data. So if they just have files, they can be files of any type, so they've got files and folders on their computer. Essentially, it works as a kind of a Dropbox um, where people can simply host their folders <coughs> remotely. Um, so they're actually centrally hosted, again, cloud hosted, where they can be backed up. Um, but unlike Dropbox, it also has um, a number of metadata enhancements. So it's very simple to add kind of standard kind of research metadata to the kind of files and folders you're generating. So again, what can happen is you've got this, this idea where you can carry on working with your data whilst you're working on your research projects exactly as you would normally, but then you can choose to effectively archive, long-term archive, put it into the data bank system with its accompanying metadata when you want at the end of the project beforehand and so forth to make the whole process kind of uh, much more straightforward than it would otherwise be. Um, it's also very easy to change the access permissions. So if you're working in a research team, you can share particular files or folders with your colleagues and keep other ones private. Data Bank, as I've mentioned, is uh, the university's data repository to be. Uh, we're still working on it, but it's it's getting there these days. Um, basically, we're defining data for the purposes of data bank. We define data as anything, any research outputs that don't fit in in order in the Oxford Research Archive. So anything that doesn't look like a, a research article basically can go in here. So it can be pretty much anything really, but uh, it's a very flexible system based on Fedora. Um, but the idea is that uh, people can put their data in here and they can link that data to articles in Aura. They don't have to link it to, to articles in Aura. It can be freestanding data, but it will all be catalogued with the appropriate metadata schema and available for people to come and access should the access permissions be given to them. It also assigns um, digital object identifiers to things to um, make citations and so forth easier in the future. Um, it enables embargo periods as one would expect and there's uh, also a dark eye for um, research data which needs to be kept and preserved and which shouldn't be made available to the public for uh, various ethical or other reasons. Um, another tool that we've just started working on is the Oxford uh, DMP online. Uh, this is data management planning online. Essentially, the DMP online is a tool that the Digital Curation Center um, has been working on in the UK. Um, essentially, it's, it's an online system which 
is designed as a, as a kind of a template builder for researchers who need to produce a data management plan. So the idea is you can type in or just select from a list of the, the research council you're, you're bidding to and it will ask you the right questions um, that that research council actually wants as part of their data management plan. So instead of playing through every possible aspect of data management, it narrows it down to the ones that your, your research funder might actually be interested in. It enables people to uh, um, create, save and submit and, uh, and use their data management plans and so forth. Now the Oxford version of this, um, the original version was basically designed nationally, so this is a customized version that we've been producing. Um, but it's also effectively a bit of a critique in the original one as well because we've actually been doing quite a bit of user testing within, within Oxford and the findings so far is that the original version was was rather technical, it was written from a kind of a, a sort of a library as an information management kind of perspective and background and obviously it's not really the kind of world that our researchers live in. Uh, so we've been trying to modify it and change it to, to really better respond to what researchers are looking for. Um, the idea is that it's um, data site and serif um, compatible. Uh, data site, I'm not sure how well known that is. I'm, I suspect that many of you probably would have heard of it, but it's it's establishing a kind of a, a core set of metadata that needs to be required in order to cite data, as the name suggests. And serif is kind of um, a metadata format that works particularly with um, research information systems. So the administrative people who are keeping track of um, uh, grant numbers, applications, uh, principal investigators, all those kind of things to make sure that we can both input um, to those kind of systems and draw metadata from them as needed. Um, and essentially we're going to make a kind of a data bank, in fact it probably will use a data bank system um, to store these data management plans. So the idea is we can store the plans alongside um, the actual data that uh, projects actually come up with, um, making it far easier um, to see what people were we're intending from the beginning, um, link it all together with information about where the funding came from and so forth, um, see what data was actually submitted at the end and all those kind of aspects of it. So Data Finder, this is um, what I'm working on really at the moment. Data Finder is another piece of software um, which will be able to create a, um, a registry of research data. Um, it'll have a, an interface for searching for data, um, browsing and reporting it. Now this won't simply be picking up data from data bank, but we'll be taking data from a number of different sources. I don't know if you can really see the architecture we've got there on the on the side, but we're taking information um, from data bank. We're also taking information from the online research database um, service. Um, we'll be taking information from departmental data stores. We're actually going to be enabling people, even if they've got non-electronic data, to actually enter information about that data and where it's physically stored so that um, non-electronic data can can be discovered and uh, reused if permission if permissions allow and the person gets in touch with the creator and so forth. Um, it will also be looking at some services beyond University of Oxford. So for instance, Colwiz is a Web2 kind of a Facebook for researchers kind of service really where um, researchers can share data and uh, citations and so forth with each other and we'll be connecting it to that so that this data that people are sharing in, in this effectively a commercial service outside of Oxford can also be captured uh, and included in Data Finder. Um, the metadata schema is based on data site, we're expanding that at the moment to make sure that we can also, we also have metadata fields that can fulfill all the requirements, um, all the requirements of the various research councils, because some of the research councils have additional requirements on top of the kind of core metadata schema that we originally came up with IXA. And it's a hierarchical, we're building it sort of as a, on a hierarchical structure so that you can have a sort of a departmental data finder, for instance, and then have on top of that a university data finder which can harvest uh, all the information from the departmental data finders. And then hopefully in the longer run we can actually have a sort of a national data finder which will be able to harvest all sorts of other data finders and produce a kind of a national record of the various, um, various, various data held in various different places around the country. Or, beyond the country. In terms of training and sport, we've done a, we've produced a number of different materials. Uh, we've got our main hub, as I've already um, spoken about. We've got leaflets that we've been using to hand out to, um, to new uh, doctoral and postdoc students at the university. So when we attend induction sessions, we can hand those out. Basically quick guides to where you can turn to for advice. We've prepared some presentations 
for induction sessions, which it doesn't have to be delivered by ourselves, our kind of immediate team, but hopefully it's simple enough to be given by people in the departments and faculties. We've got some worksheets with some hints and tips that people can, can read. Uh, we've actually got we've, we've got a system within the university called um, the research the research uh, what's it, the, the, the research skills toolkit, which gives information and hints and tips and software advice on all sorts of different aspects of research across all disciplines. Um, so research data management only really forms one aspect of that. But we've added a number of um, pages of content to that to try and fill that gap because previously there was very little uh, research data management within Oxford. Um, that's an example of one of the kind of uh, one of the kind of information pages with it. This particular one's about choosing bibliographic software. <clears throat> We've also prepared a couple of three-hour courses uh, with a picture of the course book you can see there, which we have delivered and which were very well received. Now, all of this information is available via the uh, Sudani website, and uh, I think also now via the Damaro website as well. So this is all publicly available. Um, we have Oxford's non-branded versions, so we've, we did a, we've got our Oxford branded versions that you can see there, but we've also done versions which are intended to be picked up and used by other universities which don't have the Oxford branding. Um, if you search the, I think it's called the JORUM, J-O-R-U-M, um, Learning Object Repository uh, in the UK, which is open to everyone, you'll find unbranded versions of all of these training materials in there. And oh, that's just a page from within one of the uh, one of the exercise books. So these are intended for the three-hour courses, but they have kind of do-it-yourself exercises that uh, the students who attend the course can work through uh, while they while they're actually in the session. Now those are the main kind of tools you're working on. There is, of course, a lot of related infrastructure which wasn't specifically built as part of our research data management um, work, but which is either already existing in the university or which we're working on, which kind of we need to connect our, our research data management infrastructure into. So our HFS backup and preservation system I've mentioned already, it's been going for years, it does its job. <coughs> We're working on a storage as a service system. Um, believe it or not, Oxford University does not actually have central storage which we can offer researchers. Most universities I think do these days, but until recently every department has basically had their own storage, people have stored things locally and their departmental servers on their own computers, but we've not actually had um, essentially provided storage service. We're going to be um, producing one. Coal, as I've kind of mentioned, uh, it's really available for anyone to use. Um, do have a look at it, it's kind of interesting. Um, our private cloud and virtual data center we've now got up and running. That was built as part of the Vidas project, but it's going to be used beyond purely for research data management. It's, there's all sorts of uses you can put to. Uh, we have <coughs> our supercomputing center. Um, it's not the only high performance computing center we offer, some of the departments have their own. Everyone tends to uh, do their own thing in Oxford. In fact, it's kind of built into the constitution of the university. Uh, we're developing um, a sort of a, a bigger, better research information system used by our research services. We haven't really had a single research um, information system before. We're working on one now, and our metadata will be tied into that, as I mentioned. Uh, we've got our Oxford Research Archive for, um, for theses and articles. And we're also, having a, we're also starting a pilot project looking at digital archiving much more broadly, not for research data, but just for, for everything, particularly for um, administrative records and so forth. So to return to the life cycle I kind of showed earlier, um, this kind of illustrates really how the bits of infrastructure we're building kind of actually fits in to our overall vision. So the DMP online tool is very much um, based at the to kind of an intervention of the project planning stage of, of any project, to try and get them off on the right foot by really thinking through how they are going to deal with their data, what data they're actually going to be producing, and what's going to, what's going to happen to it at the end of it. <coughs> and the online research database service um, and data stage are really services to help researchers when they're, when they're working with the active data, when they're actually conducting the research itself, when they're actually gathering the data, they're analyzing it, they're trying to produce the research outputs. Um, some of the ORDs looking at the structured data and data stage dealing with the unstructured data. The data bank system is kind of our institutional storage. And then Data Finder will have the role of, um, of allowing a rediscovery mechanism for the data and also a retrieval mechanism. Data Finder itself won't be um, doing the retrieval. That will basically push people back to the source where the data that's catalogued has come from. And uh, there might well be um, restrictions on who can actually access the data, but it'll, it'll show you what data is available and, and take you to the place where it can be retrieved. 
and underpinning all of this is the training and support, the various um, the various training and support things we we've already implemented, and we've got a lot more work to do because most of our actual software services are still in development, and we need to do a lot of documentation and training specifically on how to use those bits of software, as well as the more general kind of advice and training that we've been putting together so far. I mentioned the EPSERC requirements um, as part of the national context at, at the beginning of it. Um, <clears throat> they're really, um, they've given fresh impetus really to the whole drive in the UK to, to implement this kind of uh, research data management infrastructure. Hang on, I apologise. Cool. Um, and what they've, what they've done differently from the past is that they're really putting the emphasis on the institution rather than the researcher um, to have that kind of um, the RDM infrastructure in place. So whereas previously most of the research councils would have, would have said it's the obligation of the researcher and the research group to make sure their data is well handled and becomes available afterwards. And if they fail to do that, uh, then it would be the researcher or their research group that would have problems getting funding in future. Uh, the EPSEC have really changed that. They've put the onus on the institutions. And whilst previously a lot of institutions in the UK were kind of sort of monitoring developments, seeing what's going on, all of a sudden, every institution has now got to got to have their own kind of their own way of dealing with things in place. So everyone's got uh, terribly excited. It's uh, focused the minds of senior management, as I mentioned there, um, in a way that it, it probably worked before, apart from maybe at a few institutions such as Oxford, um, Edinburgh, Southampton, um, Bristol, and a few others. But now it's becoming much more of a kind of a, a widespread mainstream concern in the UK to really get this kind of data management infrastructure up and running. Uh, they've uh, requested a roadmap. Um, explaining how universities are actually going to be able to do all this by 2015. Uh, so we've we've done ours and kind of sent it off. I've only got a draft version, so I'm not going to show it here because it'll be inaccurate and not up to date. But that really is um, really is focusing minds. So we have now got ourselves a new draft policy as well. Um, after the initial one um, generated during the ICSA project was kind of uh, not approved for reasons given earlier, we've actually we've actually got a new one. I've I think this is up for it's either just been formally approved or it's up for formal approval very shortly. Um, it's short, it's only two sides of text, albeit in a small font. Um, it's influenced by the Ten Commandments of the University of Edinburgh, um, which if you're not familiar with already you can have a look at. They're basically kind of uh, essential data management principles which, which state what the university should provide. Um, a couple of quotations, the university acknowledges its obligations under research funders' uh, data-related policy statements. This is pretty much, I think, as a direct result of that EPSERC, um, the EPSERC conditions. And goes to practice to ensure that sound systems are in place to promote best practice, including through clear policy, guidance, supervision, training, and support. And I have to say that this is still a little bit of, um, of, a, of a future vision because we don't really have that much in the way of um, uh, data management training through supervision, I think a lot of uh, a lot of the supervisors in the university that are looking at uh, uh, supervising um, doctoral studies and postdocs probably aren't really that expert themselves in RDM, so there's still work to do before we can really um, follow this policy in its, in its full, I think, but uh, it seems to be going through in the, in the way it is anyway. Um, and whilst previously the initial draft policy had really divided uh, responsibilities between uh, between researchers, so researchers were given some specific responsibilities, departments given certain others, and uh, the university to hold certain others. Um, it is now emphasizing this is much more of a shared kind of uh, a shared thing. And the need to work in partnership is really being stressed much more. Um, on the kind of more technical front, there's a minimum retention period for each um, for research data and records of three years, although many of the actual research councils uh, requested that's much much longer than that. So the EPSERC, uh, for instance, say that um, research data must be held for 10 years after the last time it was accessed, which adds an extra element of, um, of difficulty on what we have to do because that means we have to really be able to monitor uh, when the data was actually accessed as well as then keeping it for 10 years longer than that. So the, the three year is, a, is an absolute minimum, I think. Most data will end up having to keep beyond that. Um, I should point out throughout all of this that if there's already good um, subject specific repositories, we're as a university not expecting to hold that data. We're expecting it to be placed in those repositories and then an entry created in Data Finder to know that people at the university have created this data and you should go to that repository to access it. So really what we're putting in Data Bank, we put pretty much anything in there, um, 
which is kind of for all those subject disciplines which fall between the gaps, and there's a lot of them. Um, okay, actually, I think I've kind of mentioned this already, but uh, uh, this this kind of highlights some of the some of the responsibilities that uh, the people that we do still have. Uh, correct myself here a bit, but we do still have some responsibilities which have been placed particularly on the researchers or the university as well as the shared responsibilities. Um, so the researchers are responsible for actually managing their research data and records according to the principles. Um, they're, they're the ones that are actually responsible for collecting, storing it, using it, and everything in such a way that we can capture the data at the end of it, um, and planning for that ongoing custodianship, whereas the university is responsible really for making sure that the services and facilities are there that the researchers need. Okay, so that pretty much covers everything. Just to mention the forthcoming developments, the things we're going to be moving on to. Um, next things we need to really start doing is um, collating all the training materials and starting to embed them in the divisions and faculties. Obviously, we've, said we've been working so far as, as projects, as project teams. And whilst we can trial all our training materials, um, the people who are working the project teams aren't going to be around there next year, the year after, in order to really ensure that these training materials get used. So we're having a big push at the moment to try and get the departments and the faculties to really take up these training materials, to understand them themselves, and to deploy them themselves in future years. Uh, we need to start promoting the policy to researchers. That'll be an interesting one, and uh, quite a, a, it'll take us a, a long time, I think, to really get the message through, because it's quite a culture change. In many disciplines. Uh, we need to really productionize the software. All the tools we've been working on, they're all kind of getting there, but not actually kind of released as full production services yet. Um, we'll need to add additional functionality throughout these projects. We've been interviewing researchers and trying to work with them to understand exactly what they need. We'll be covering the basics when we release the software, but there's always going to be more um, use cases, more obscure use cases where people are going to have very particular requirements about, say, um, who can access which bits of databases, uh, particularly in medicine we're finding this, that they, have, they need to have very fine-grained access, um, access policies. Uh, we need to actually make sure the services are, are sustainable. Uh, we've done a quite a bit of costing um, work, and, uh, but a lot of these services were not built off for free, which adds an extra element of difficulty because we're expected to actually re you know, recover, recover the costs of providing these services, and a lot of them aren't going to be cheap. Uh, we need to re really make sure that the metadata really can th flow through that um, through that life cycle that you saw, so that we really are gathering all the metadata um, and making our records as rich as we possibly can, and also enabling citations and so forth, and also just integrating tools developed elsewhere. Because while I've been talking about what we're doing at Oxford, there's an awful lot of other universities who are also um, developing tools. We're we're focusing mostly on a very much um, a cross disciplinary um, pan-university kind of approach. A lot of other universities in the UK are working on tools for particular research disciplines, whereas it looks from that diagram as though we, we're basically going to have covered the whole lot. There'll be all sorts of disciplinary differences um, between things, which means it won't work quite as smoothly and, and our kind of administration won't be quite as full as that illustration made it look, uh, as we want to try and integrate the work that other universities have been doing. And I think slightly overrun my initial predictions, but I think that's about it. So uh, there's some sites there that you can uh, refer to, but I think I'm now open for questions.